6 a.m., we all line up at the Ofra checkpoint outside Ramallah. I had to leave home at 5 in the morning. The families who come from outside the city had to leave home as early as 3. We've all got our permits and the bus tickets we had to buy at the Red Cross office. For the families outside the city, that was an extra day and night. They had to come through checkpoints to Ramallah and back. We have to be at the checkpoint by 6 a.m. or we miss our chance. We stand in the cold and wait for the checkpoint to open whenever the Israeli soldiers feel like it. A visit from my family is like a lifeline, like breathing. I spend days preparing for it. I shave and I, I comb my hair for days. I put on cologne. I know, I know what you're thinking. Cologne behind thick glass, who's gonna smell it? It's for me, really. Sometimes I tell my wife, I'm wearing cologne. I know she can smell it. After the checkpoint finally opens, we go through a series of holding spaces and wait. Between each room or holding area, we have to go through those metal spoked gates that revolve and can hurt you if you're not careful. Some of the holding areas are outdoors, only partially covered, no chairs, no benches, no place to sit but on the ground or floor. Finally, they herd us into a room with a metal detector and moving belt to x-ray our bags. With soldiers watching through big windows, I show my ID and drop it through a slot to an Israeli officer with rubber gloves, who will run a check on the phone and computer. In a tiny room, they body check me with a wand and their hands. If my bra has metal, I have to take it off. After three or four, maybe five hours, it's nine or 10 or 11 a.m. and we all get taken to wait by the buses. This is the first chance since before 6 a.m. to use a restroom. But the only restroom outside here is never cleaned, never. And most of us find it too disgusting to use. The Israelis don't care. They call us dirty anyways. The next chance will be about three hours away. I lost my voice. I lost my ability to express myself. I look for words, but I stumble and I can't find them. I was a little girl when Israeli soldiers came to the apartment and took my brother. I was 11 years old. I watched them tie his hands and blindfold them. There was nothing I could do. He's always on my mind. When I work, when I play, when I eat or visit friends, I'm constantly wondering if I'm going to get a call that my son has died or been killed in prison. This is with me all the time. It never goes away. I have nightmares and wake up sweating like I'm being taunted or haunted or stabbed in my heart. I live with it physically every day. It's like I'm in prison with him. In Palestine, we're all in prison. The difference between being inside or outside could be nothing. It could be saying the wrong thing, being at the wrong place and breathing the wrong air, riding the wrong bus or taking the wrong road. You can be picked up for nothing, for one reason only, you are the wrong kind of person. My son went to preschool in Olympia, Washington. He was bright and energetic and he was black. So he got tracked as one of those kids. Instead of encouraged, he got corrected and taught he would fail. All his life, when he walks out the door, he's a suspect. My son was arrested in April 2002. He was 18 years old. They arrested my husband as well. He was 47. The Israelis arrested all the Palestinian males in our building. 
this happened all across Ramallah. They took my husband and beat him up and let him go at night in the rain in his underwear to walk the several kilometers home. He had to lie down for several days after. He didn't know until he got home that our son had not been released. It used to be that you might leave your house and not know if you will make it home that day. But now you go to sleep in your house and you don't know if soldiers will break in and take you away in front of your family. It gets so, it's usual, it's normal, it's, it's everyone. It's our life. It's our children's life. Israeli military law makes it so Palestinians can be held for six months without charge or trial. It's called as administrative detention. And they can renew it over and over for years. My son has only been charged, not convicted. He's been in for over a year, but no court date yet. A lot of men in there don't have court dates and they can be held without trial for years. In Israeli prison, they don't bring you enough food. So you can't get by without money from your family. Everything costs money. Soap, toothpaste, a pen, a book, socks, food beyond the little they give him, even the phone or the video visits, and we get cut off because we can't afford the cost. Your family has already lost a provider. And then they have this monthly expense of having that provider in prison. There's a whole industry that makes a profit from every phone call, every meal, every product that families have to provide. Honestly, if he wouldn't be, he wouldn't be able to survive in there if I didn't provide financial support. I have to take extra contracts, even if I'm tired or exhausted because I'm the only person he has. Nobody understands what it feels like to have a child locked up without speedy trial rights, without safe food or a sky to look at. The drive on the bus is about three hours. The buses don't have restrooms and no stops are allowed. One time, an elderly woman really needed to go to the bathroom, but the driver wasn't allowed to stop. The woman was in such a bad way, the driver phoned and had a whole negotiation with the police to give him a one-time permission to stop so the woman could step off and use the side of the road. But by that time, it was too late and the woman had soiled herself. You're allowed two letters in a month with a limited number of pages. Two letters are worth a visit. My daughters learned how to fill the page with very tiny handwriting. A letter from the family is worth half a visit if the letter ever gets here. Once there was a family where no one was allowed to visit the prison except the four-year-old daughter. So she had to make the trip by herself. All the rest of us did our best to take care of the little girl, but she cried all day and night. We saw her another time when other family members had been given a permit, but the little girl screamed and refused to get on that bus again, with, even with her parents. Before his hearing, I would go visit my brother, see him from behind glass. I cried all the way. When they prevented me from visiting, I would cry outside the prison gate. My family would tell me, don't cry, your brother will get upset, or don't cry in front of the soldiers. We don't cry in front of the soldiers. On the day of his court, I asked to leave school to see him. A soldier stopped me from entering the courtroom. My mother started screaming at them, but they told her if she didn't stop screaming, they would keep her out too. I watched everyone else go in. Then I went to the soldier and I said, you will always remember that you prevented a young girl from seeing her brother. From that moment on, I felt that this soldier would never be able to scare me again. Our daughter used to do nothing but smile. She still likes to smile and giggle, but now the, the smile will stop 
and a, a sad, worried look will make you forget the smile was ever there. This will happen when soldiers drive by or when the phone rings because it might be her brother from Ashkelon prison. They smuggled a mobile phone into the prison, so sometimes my brother can call. One time I was out and my cell phone rang, but there was no good reception in that spot. I ran all around trying to find some place better, but I couldn't find one, and the ringing stopped. I was meeting with some friends, and I sat down with them. I, I didn't want to cry, but I couldn't help it. Sometimes it's even harder when the call comes through. The minute he says, hi, mom, my heart breaks. He was always the source of strength for us. He was the brother who supported his little sister. I remember when he bought a large box of ice cream to hide and we ate it together in his room. I remember one year he worked during the school break and bought me expensive shoes. Those shoes were a treasure for me. I wore them every day until they wore out. He always helps me find my mental balance when it's disturbed. Even when he's in prison, my brother is my strength. For the first few years after he was sentenced, none of us were allowed to visit him except his sister, who was 11 years old. Because she was under 16, she didn't have the compulsory ID card that all Palestinians have to carry. It happens that she was born in Jerusalem, so she could show her birth certificate, and she was allowed to travel across Israel. Every Sunday, this 11-year-old girl would travel for hours across Israel for less than a one-hour visit with her brother in prison. When she turned 16, she had to get the Palestinian ID, and, and that was the end of her visits to her brother. My brother lost a lot of weight after one of the hunger strikes. He suffered from intestinal problems and did not go to the bathroom for more than 10 days. This was the most important topic discussed in our home. My husband is over 45 years old. So even when none of us were allowed, he was supposed to be able to visit our son. He traveled all the way down to Bir Saba in the neck of the desert to see him. When he got there, they told him he couldn't visit after all because like most Palestinian men, he had spent time in prison himself. I had a dream last night. I dreamed I was back in prison. Most times I feel like I'm in a dream and none of this is real. It's like my son has died but I don't know how to grieve when he's still alive. When holidays come around, I get very depressed. Last year, the entire month of December, I checked out of society. I couldn't face anyone, so I decided to give myself permission to be depressed the entire month. I decided that that would be a form of self-care, to be kind to my mind and body and just feel my feelings. But people can't understand. I feel like the only person I can have this conversation with is my son. My husband is a labor organizer. So Israel put him in prison a bunch of times since the first intifada when our children were very little. He was gone long enough one time that when he came home, our very young daughter didn't know what to call him. She did the best she could and gave him a special name for a while. She called him Amo Baba, which means Uncle Daddy. He's been in there more than once. And when he comes out, he comes out worse. He doesn't want to be touched. He's got anger that won't be stopped. He's learned more violence. Whatever values he had, whatever self-care and self-worth he had, whatever ways he had to cope, those get battered. Whatever problems or traumas he had, those get aggravated. Prison is violence. They force him in, they do him harm, and they spit him out, and he comes out the worst version of himself. I'm his mom. 
I'll never stop loving him for a minute, for an instant, but sometimes I can't take it. Sometimes when he's like that, it's too much for me. My wife is a therapist, but it's hard for her to work because she's experiencing trauma herself. My daughters grow up faster than they want to. They don't like feeling that it's making them tough. They had to work hard to keep hope alive. Nine years, they keep reminding themselves it's better than a sentence for life. My son got COVID-19 in jail. The guards don't wear masks. They go in and out of prison. The whole two weeks he was sick, the jail wouldn't treat him or give him meds until the last three days. He's still dealing with after symptoms. I had nightmares. I would wake up at two or three or six. I was sure he had died from COVID. After the three hour drive, we get to the prison. They let us off to wait outside on stone benches. It's usually about 1.30 or 2 p.m. And here, the restrooms are usable. This will be my only chance to use a restroom until I get home late at night. In a couple more hours, by 4 p.m. or so, my turn will come for the visit. 10 hours or more since we left home. I'm allowed 45 minutes to speak with my son by telephone on the other side of a glass wall. I fight for every second of those minutes. If the guards turn off the phone line a few seconds early, I fight for those few seconds. Yeah, they do it. They, they, they turn off the, the phone line and I yell at the guards. Hey, open the line back up. I'm still allowed five more seconds. Every day, I wish time would run fast, but during the visit, I wish for the clock to stop. We can't talk about his case or how he's changed because all those calls are recorded. I can't find out if he's really okay, if he's being mistreated or being beat up by the cops in there. In the late evening, 9 or 10 or 11 p.m., the buses drop everyone back at Kalandia checkpoint. We all find our way home from there using regular cabs or shared service vehicles. For me, that means riding into Ramallah and catching another vehicle to our house, maybe half an hour. For those in the villages, it, it's longer. They might reach home past midnight after one bathroom stop in early afternoon and a whole day and night under guard. When my mother got seriously ill, they granted her ongoing permits to visit her son every two weeks for a period of one year. But she was already weak and it took her days to recover from each visit. So she couldn't do it every time. And sometimes she would have to stay home and be miserable for missing any chance to see him. To the prison way down at Bir Sabah, the trip is longer. More buses go there. More visitors are squeezed into smaller waiting rooms. One room, sometimes they might have 55 visitors waiting in a 15 foot square unventilated space. People get dizzy and faint all the time. Only one bathroom for eight buses full of people. Sometimes prisoners tell their families not to come visit because they can't stand seeing their families treated like prisoners. Sometimes when I try to walk in the morning or meditate or listen to music, I feel guilty for having these pleasures when my son doesn't even have clean water or healthy food. I give my dog better food than what they get in there. If people knew what was happening in jail, they would be appalled and the system would change. But nobody cares or wants to hear about it and the prisoners are locked up 
out of sight, out of mind. If people knew what was happening in jail, they would be appalled and the system would change. Yeah, it could change. The first thing is they could admit that prison is violence. Prison is violence. They could acknowledge that prison is violence against our loved ones and against us when they treat us like not even human and stick their fingers in our mouths or make us take off our underwear and gaslight us every day and tell us our loved ones deserve it. Like telling a woman she deserved it because she wore that dress. Like not even human. They could admit that when black or brown or poor people ask for protection, we don't get it. They could admit that they don't build prisons to keep us safe. They don't build prisons to keep us safe. They could give us back our children. They could give us back our children. They could give us support in our own communities to live and survive and to find ways to hold each other to account. Find ways to hold each other to account in our own communities. If you want to rehabilitate people, you don't lock them up and pass them to the wind. You need to look at what happened to them. You need to give them a way to come back, to re-enter society. We need to build something that doesn't sacrifice our loved ones for profit. We need a new way of thinking about this. A world without prisons? Yes. Prisons will end when occupation and racism end. Our battle is against the whole colonialist project, not just one of its tools. What is needed is the solidarity with the victims in the world, victims of colonialism, occupation, racism, injustice. It is no coincidence that during our protest against the police killing of Iyad al-Hallaq in occupied Jerusalem, we raised a picture of George Floyd. On the day they sentenced our son, the military judge told him to stand. He did stand up. He said to them, I'm standing because my parents are here, not for you. I hold no ill will against any Jew or Israeli. I have the right to resist occupation. Your punishment will be like a medal of honor to me. You should put your soldiers and your occupation on trial, not me. During my mother's illness, even near the end, I was confident that our brother would be with us and that she would not leave us until he returned home. But she's gone. She was 57. When my mother left, my voice left with her. We need a new way of thinking about this. A world without prisons? Yes. I am one of 7,000 Palestinian political prisoners who believe that injustice will fail while liberation and human dignity will be fulfilled. Regardless of how painful it is, we will never deviate from that road. Their occupation and their racist state, no matter how long, is temporary. But our destiny is freedom. Tahiyat ijlal wa ihtiram likul al asra wa asirat fi sujun al ihtilal walil asra dawi al bashra al samra fi sujun al amerikiya. Kulubuna ma'akum wa la budda lil qaydi an yankasir. Hurriyat al asra min hurriyat al shab wa yabqa al mustakbal wa'idan. Fal amal yuwalid al amal. Insa ki wal khamstashar sini kint bhaddini ma kint bhaddini tsayf wachatti biduni dini So
حبستوني انت صرخ انا بريء تركتوني ورحت علينا سهري ما قلتوا في ناس لا يد ولا حري وبرد ما اقدر ارفع صور على هالحيطان شم Thank you for joining us on Palestinian Prisoners Day. We hope that you will stay for a discussion with Cassandra Butler, organizer and advocate with the Black Prisoners Caucus, Free Them All, and Ramzi Baroud, director of palestinechronicle.com and author of These Chains Will Be Broken, Palestinian stories of struggle and defiance in Israeli prisons. I will be taking your chats um, and comments and um, handing them out to Ramzi and Cassandra. Cassandra, I'm going to ask you, what are the parallels do you see between Palestinian black prisons and the system that they're caught in, besides the ones mentioned in the play? Um, I mean, I think the biggest parallel I see in prison systems and, and in these two systems are just the um, lack of humanity. Um, for both families that are connected to folks that are incarcerated and um, the incarcerated folks themselves. There's just no um, dignity afforded, um, you know, in the stories that I was hearing about the Palestinian journey, um, it matches with the story I was hearing from um, about the child, the mother and the child, um, in, you know, black mother and child in the prison system in the United States, it's just, the folks that work in these systems, there's no decency afforded and they don't, they never stop to think about how it impacts families, um, not just in the immediate, but for many years to come and that repeat cycle of coming out of prisons or being formally incarcerated and how that impacts your abilities to do anything when you come home or in the future. Thanks, Cassandra. Ramzi, do you have some? Uh, first, can you hear me now? Yes, we can. Excellent, thank you. excellent. Well, first, very quickly, thank you so much for that wonderful reading, really beautiful. I'm doing an audio recording for my own book on prisoners, and I felt envious. You guys were just, you know, by far better. So I, I've learned a few tricks from these uh, incredible voices and actors, uh, really good work. Um, just wanted to say something very quick here is that in the Palestinian case, uh, of course, the element of intersectionality here is, is, is absolutely crucial to the way we understand and we should understand that this uh, prison experience. But also in the Palestinian case, I also think it's important that we also work diligently to liberate the narrative from this idea that Palestinians are, are mere victims uh, in, in this. Yes, of course, they are victims, but they are um, kind of their vic victimization is a microcosm of the larger victimization that affects all Palestinians everywhere, but especially those who are living these various open air prisons, whether in the Gaza Strip, whether in, in various apartheid uh, um, isolated areas in the West Bank area, A, B, and C, and so forth. When a Palestinian is not able to leave his village, to, get, to go to the city, to go to a hospital, to go to school, to go to his farm, or, 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 or to join you know, their families. Or to, I mean, that is a form of imprisonment. So all Palestinians really are at some level. They are all prisoners. But the other issue here is that these are not uh, uh, people who 
you know, th their narrative is, is that of freedom fighters. I think it's essential that we do so. And I think, I, I, or, or we understand it as such. These are men, women, and women who made a choice. And the choice is to resist, to fight back, to be the vanguards of, of their community, of their families, of their villages, of their cities, of their nation, everywhere. So, so I, the way I see Palestinian prisoners, as, as we get from the text they produce, from the content, from the material, from the speeches they give, from the writing that they are constantly, that constantly streamlined into Palestinian society, is that these are not hapless men and women. These are men and women who actually made a choice, and the choice can be very, very costly, but they did it anyway because they are the leaders of Palestinian community. They are what, what Antonio Gramsci refers to as, as the organic intellectuals. They are the true engaged intellectuals of Palestinian society and they balance out the corruption that happens within our government in the West Bank. They balance out the normalization that's happening between Arabs and Israel and so forth. If, if these men and women are not fighting, there is no fight. And their fight is an extension of the fight of the Palestinian people everywhere. I think th this has to be acknowledged as well because it's absolutely essential to the narrative of Palestinian prisoners. Thank you, Ramzi, for that. I do have a question also. Um, what is the life of adolescent Black people like after they leave prison? Um, I mean, in my experience, um, both my brother um, and partner are currently incarcerated. And so in my own personal experience, what I can say is um, it, doesn't, it doesn't make anything easier. It makes it more difficult. So what prison does not do is rehabilitate young people. Um, it does not teach you anything. You're not learning a lesson. Um, you're caged away like an animal, treated like an animal and then released, expected to just figure it out. And for black and brown youth coming out of prison, um, you know, it, with families that are struggling because they've been having to support this young person inside of prison while supporting themselves outside, um, they've got to figure out now a way to address the harms that were caused inside of prison. Before a young black person can come out um, and get a job or enroll in school, or you know, they, they come out and have to meet additional Department of Correction um, requirements. Fees have to be paid and check-ins have to be done and drug tests have to be done. And all of these things in addition to figuring out what your next steps are. So nothing good comes out of prison. When young people come out of prison, they have to start over. And if they are fortunate enough that their families are able to financially support that restart, um, emotionally support that restart, um, then they may have a chance. But the reality is, especially now, post COVID um, you know, pandemic, the reality is most people don't come out to that kind of support system because people out here are struggling just to support themselves and maintain until they're their sons, daughters, brothers, uncles, until those folks come out, we're struggling just to figure out a way to make it until they get here, so. Thank you. Uh, what are the current struggles that we're trying to win in Washington state regarding incarceration? Um, some of the, the major struggles that we're trying to win are um, just humane treatment. Um, I organize with Free Them All um, Collective and we are prison abolitionists. So we are pushing for obviously the, the closing and shutdown of all prisons. We don't believe in prison systems for anyone. Um, but immediately what we're trying to win is a defunding of the Department of Corrections, repurposing that money into communities, um, a decarceration of at least 50% of the population immediately because we all know that um, prisons are overcrowded in this current pandemic. You can't social distance. You can't properly protect yourself from this pandemic. So we're pushing for immediate release um, of folks for health and safety reasons. Um, we're also you know, constantly pushing for better healthcare and just better treatment inside of prisons. We are always 
um, advocating on behalf of people. The stories are constant that come out about the abuse that's being suffered, the overuse of solitary confinement. In fact, Washington state prisons used solitary confinement as medical isolation during the COVID pandemic. So people were placed in solitary to be separated um, and, and safer is, is the, is what DOC tried to, you know, disguise it as. Um, so we're constantly pushing for just humane treatment. Um, until we get these prisons shut down, people need to be treated like people. Um, and most recently, um, the relationship between DOC and ICE. So um, struggling to break that relationship, the Northwest Detention Center um, that's in Washington State will be closing, it looks like in 2025, I believe. And so um, really struggling to stop those DOC to ICE transfers because those are two systems that work in collusion with each other to continue the suffrage of human beings. Um, what else beyond ending prisons do our parallel societies have to do to make things right for the families and communities impacted by incarceration? I mean, I would say putting money into your community. Um, providing education, providing resources into your community. Your prisons are not full of people that were afforded a ton of opportunities through their life, that were, that were given another choice or another gateway. They're full of people who are from communities that are impoverished, impoverished are not, um, money's not fed into them. People are not paying attention. So really concentrating on resources, healthcare, mental health care, substance abuse focus, um, all of these things that are drivers behind what feed people into the school to prison pipeline, um, into the nonprofit to prison pipeline. I mean, all of these systems are connected and funneling people into prisons and not paying attention to the root issues. So um, for me, I would say it's the root issues you need to pay attention to and rebuilding your communities and rebuilding your families and not tearing them apart. Yeah, absolutely. Um, what way forward do you see towards ending the occupation and apartheid and Zionism in Palestine, Jamzi? Well, I mean, obviously the, the occupation will end because of the resistance of the Palestinian people. I mean, they are ultimately going to be the party that is going to be the decisive party in bringing that occupation to an end. Um, but what is our responsibility towards, towards that as people who are, um, uh, standing in solidarity with the Palestinian people. Uh, we need to do everything in our power to hold Israel accountable, to hold Israeli war criminals accountable, to expose Israeli apartheid and racism. One of the most successful strategies that Israel uh, is, is using and utilizing is the, in the moment is, is the branding. They are able to brand themselves to, um, as if they are an, indeed an oasis of democracy uh, and human rights that they are standing uh, there for, um, for women rights, for gay rights, and so forth and so on. But in actuality, they are doing the exact opposite. Uh, it's, uh, and, and this is something that we, it's our responsibility to spread the word out on Israel's behavior, Israel's uh, uh, true intentions of its occupation. This apartheid and this racism manifests itself in numerous ways every day in Palestine. People, um, the, the, these testimonies that were read uh, today, I think this would be a complete shock for average Americans everywhere, for any, anyone outside Israel, really aside from the Middle East, would be quite surprised to see this kind of uh, narrative, this kind of language of people who are living in the shadow of Israeli apartheid, racism, and military occupation. We need to do much more of this. We need to make this mainstream. We need to destroy this Israeli brand. We need to defeat the Israeli PR campaign, and, and we need to expose Israel for what it is. And by giving Palestinians solidarity, by giving Palestinians the kind of attention, the kind of platforms that they need. Palestinians don't need a charity. They are not charity cases. They are people who are fighting and they will continue to fight no matter the circumstances. You know, uh, through my research about Palestinian prisoners in Israeli prisons and, and, and the numerous interviews that we've conducted in the last few years, it was just incredible that none of the prisoners asked for anything personal. 
none of them made a case for money, many made case for funds for support of any kind. It's, 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 it's never been the case for any of them. They are, they are willing to give their own lives for their freedom and the freedom of their own family. Um, and, and, and it is so essential that we, we remember that. We remember that the Palestinian people are, are in urgent need for our solidarity, for us to speak out. And one of the best ways of speaking out, I, I saw one of the questions talking about what it can privileged Americans do. I'm not sure if that was the intention of the question to use the word privileged or not, but I actually think it's the underprivileged Americans that we need on our side. At this point, privileged people, I mean, we understand that there's an element of class struggle, not an element, actually class struggle is at the core of this fight. Um, it's the underprivileged Americans, the black people who are being mistreated, humiliated, um, shot in the back for you know, the simplest excuses. Uh, um, it's, it's these people that we need to stand by our side. It's the Native American people who have lost their lands and, 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 and their dignity and their, their, their roots and their culture and their language and they are fighting for, for that simple self-assertion. Self These are the people that we want to stand by our side. So it is intersectionality and solidarity that is based on intersectionality that will make us stronger together. We stand in solidarity with black people in this country. It's not a cliche, it's not a sentiment, it's not mere words. We, we know it, we mean it because we live it, we feel it, we feel for them. I remember when Nelson Mandela was freed all the way in South Africa, thousands of miles away from Palestine. I was living in a refugee camp in Gaza at the time. And I remember how thousands of people were marching in the streets, carrying the, the, the photos of black men and women in the streets of Gaza. I was too young to understand the, the, the connection between the causes but I understood that it was something so huge as if it's Palestine that was liberated. It is that intersectionality and that connection in our communal struggles everywhere that we need to emphasize. That's true solidarity because it's sustainable solidarity, because it's meaningful solidarity. And that will be the kind of solidarity that will eventually defeat Israel the same way it defeated apartheid in South Africa. Thank you, Ramzi, for that. Uh, I do have a question and I'm going to give it to Hannah. It is about the source of the narratives shared through the play today. Hi, Manal. Um, Hi. Yes, uh, I'll be brief. Um, we actually have done uh, um, uh, a process of collecting the material uh, through interviews from uh, families in Palestine and Seattle, Washington, um, from the African-American community here in Seattle. These are uh, families who have um, a son or a daughter or uh, a father in, in our case, um, who is in, still in prison. And we also did one interview with uh, a prisoner in, in, in Israel, from Israel in Israeli prison. Um, we put it all together and we kind of edited some of the material to make it in this format um, and uh, able to make a read um, through Zoom, not actually a stage performance. And I, I noticed one of the questions was what, what would be the next step for this material? I think we're hoping that after COVID, this can take on a different shape on, on live stage for a live performance. Um, hopefully, you know, the end of the fall or by, by next year, we would actually um, stage it um, in, in, as, a, as a live uh, full scale production. That's awesome, Hannah, thank you so much. Um, and to wrap this, I'm just gonna ask Cassandra first and then Ramzi, if you have any last comments or points to make up, please. Um, I just want to say um, this was a beautiful performance and thank you so much for um, telling the stories in such an incredible way. Um, rarely, especially in prison abolition, do I see um, these kinds of stories uplifted and factually communities don't know what's going on in other spaces because we're so hyper-focused on just staying alive every single day that we miss the stories um, of other countries and, and how other people are suffering. So 
Um, I'm grateful to be here and hope to continue to be a part of this. And thank you to all that, that watch. This is such an important story. Thank you. Um, I will add my, my uh, voice to that of Cassandra and, and, and commend you all on this wonderful performance, but also uh, Cassandra's informative uh, uh, um, you know, uh, words as well. Uh, thank you for including me. And, and just one very last thing I'd like to say is, is um, we often miss the voices of the people. We all, uh, often marginalize them as if they are not central to, to, to historical or political narratives, as if people are not political agents. And they are political agents. It's, it's all about how do you locate them? How do you find them? And how you give them the space to reclaim their own narrative? And, and it's only then that they become absolutely essential to our understanding. So thank you for allowing these, these people to have, to, to, to communicate that voice. They already have that voice. You gave them the platform to do so. Thank you for doing this. And in solidarity with our, uh, black brothers and sisters in this country, uh, always. Awesome, thank you so much for joining us today. Please um, keep watching Dunya Productions for uh, many, many more performances to come in the future. Thank you.